Numerical solution of Laplace's equation. This video will have three parts. In the first part, I just want to give you an intuitive interpretation of what the solution to Laplace's equation really is. After that, we'll discuss actually how to solve it numerically and then discuss a special case where we have an enclosed problem and then maybe parts in our grid outside of that we don't care about, how we would handle that efficiently. Intuitive interpretation of Laplace's equation. So let's just think mathematically about the meaning of Laplace's equation. So there it is. Well, what is that? We have this, this del squared, and the del is the three-dimensional derivative operation. And of course, that's squared. So we're talking about a three-dimensional second-order derivative. And so what do we know about second-order derivatives? Second-order derivatives are quantifying in some way curvature of the function, and in this case, u. So we're looking at the curvature of u. Well, in Laplace's equation, we have set that curvature to zero. That means this function u has to be varying linearly. And that's what Laplace's equation really says. This function u is varying linearly. Now that's all Laplace's equation says. Clearly there needs to be more information to solve a problem. Okay, it's varying linearly, but give me a number value of where it starts or where it ends or both and then we can solve Laplace's equation. So, but that's the big conclusion on this slide, that functions satisfying Laplace's equation vary linearly or as close to it as Laplace's equation can do. So here's how I like to think of Laplace's equation. So suppose we have a grid and we have some known values of our function. Maybe that function's nines in this region and negative nines over here, but we would like to know what the number is everywhere else such that it's as linear as Laplace's equation can conjure up. Well, when we solve Laplace's equation in these white regions, it fills in the numbers and we get an answer. And so for a large number of problems, Laplace's equation is just acting like sort of a linear number filler in her. We're filling in numbers between two places where we know the values of. That's Laplace's equation in a nutshell, and that's what it's doing. Numerical solution of Laplace's equation. I'm assuming at this point that you have a very good knowledge of how we implement our finite difference method. If that is new to you, I definitely recommend going and looking at the series of lectures on the finite difference method, because what we're about to talk about will make very little sense. Anyway, let's restrict ourselves to two dimensions and we have Laplace's equation. And so this function u is a function of x and y. So we can expand that into Cartesian coordinates, and we see that this scalar Laplacian is the second order derivative of u with respect to x squared, plus second order derivative of u with respect to y squared, and all of that equals zero. So we've just expanded Laplace's equation in Cartesian coordinates. Now at this point, this is where we implement the finite difference in a very neat way where we don't actually explicitly have to touch finite differences. But I'll fill in the steps. The way this works is we would approximate these two derivatives with finite differences. At that point, our function u becomes discrete and we have this large grid. We write that finite difference equation for every point on that grid and we end up with a large set of equations. We can put that large set of equations into a matrix equation, and that matrix equation has this form. Then with practice, we can jump immediately from Laplace's equation into this finite difference form. And so the way this works is this lowercase bold u, that's a column vector containing all of the values of u throughout the grid, reshaped to a one-dimensional array, a column vector. So even though it's two dimensions, 
Uh, think of how two-dimensional arrays are stored in memory. They're still stored linearly, and that's how we store them in U. Then we have these square matrices multiplying U, and this particular square matrix would calculate a numerical derivative, which would be a second order derivative with respect to X. And this square matrix does the same thing, except it's a second order derivative with respect to Y. And so if truly U is a solution to Laplace's equation, I should be able to take that second order derivative with respect to X, take that second order derivative with respect to Y, add those answers and get zero. And as I mentioned with practice, we can go immediately from our differential equation to matrix form. And we have nice functions that automatically build these derivative matrices for us. And it makes solving finite difference problems very, very easy. After that, we want to jump to standard form. And the way we do that is we, we factor out U on the left side of the equation. And so we're left with just some linear operation. So L could be linear or Laplace's. So I chose to use L. And L in this case is just the second order derivative matrix with respect to X plus the second order derivative matrix with respect to Y. So this is a big square matrix. It is pre-multiplying this column vector U. And if U really is a solution to Laplace's equation, all of that should equal zero. So at this point, we don't really have a solvable problem, right? L U equals zero. If we need to solve for U, we'll bring L over to the other side. We'd have L inverse times zero. That just equals zero. That is a trivial solution. We haven't given Laplace's equation enough information to solve the problem. The information it's missing is some known values. And so these will be the boundary values, even though these values aren't even really at the boundaries. So we'll create a function, and I call it the B for boundary value, I guess, but it's a two-dimensional function across the entire space that we want to find a solution. And we go ahead and we fill in numbers where they're known. Where they're not known, well, we can put anything we want to out here. They'll end up getting ignored. But a zero makes the most sense because Laplace's equation, we have a zero over to the, the right-hand side. But the way we're formulating this, they'll end up getting ignored anyway. So we have this function that contains the known values where those values are. At this point, we need to build something called a force matrix. And this is sort of like that boundary value array, but it only contains zeros and ones. Zeros everywhere we're solving Laplace's equation, ones everywhere that has a known value. So we don't actually have to solve Laplace's equation there. We know the boundary values. So this is actually pretty easy to build from that function B. You can imagine just doing some sort of logical operation on B to turn all of the non-zero numbers into one. And then once we have that, then we can reshape that to a column vector and then place it as a diagonal in a matrix. So this F is not a column vector. It is a uh, big matrix of all zeros except numbers going down the diagonal with ones in the positions corresponding to where we actually know the values of this unknown function we're trying to find. So I call that the force matrix. It's just pointing out where we want to force values to. So we have this, this function B that we've reshaped to a column vector that has the known values. And then we have this force matrix. That's the two things we need to modify our Laplace's equation to incorporate those known values. And we'll have to modify the matrix L and our column vector B to do that. And so what happens is we have first the identity matrix minus the force matrix. So this really inverts zeros and ones. And so when we pre-multiply that by L, what ends up happening to L is that all of the rows in L corresponding to points with a force value, we've zeroed out those rows. All the other rows remain intact and unchanged. So this group of terms here is another version of L with all of the rows with known values completely zeroed out. Then when we had and go ahead and add F, that puts a one in the diagonal positions of those rows that have been zeroed out. Now down here to modify B, we take this column vector B, which will have zeros everywhere except where there's known values, in which case it contains those known values. 
And I said before, where there's zeros, we really could put anything, they'll end up getting ignored. And by pre-multiplying by F, that's how they get ignored. We're going to zero out all of the points where there's not known values and retain the points where there are known values. Now, if we build B initially just with zeros everywhere that we're solving Laplace's equation, we wouldn't actually have to do this step, but I do it just because I think it makes it a little bit more robust in case we actually did do something different with that initial function B. Anyway, now we have an L prime and a B prime, and we are ready to now solve Laplace's equation and calculate all of the different numbers in between where we have our known values. So that's exactly what we do. We had an L prime U equals B prime, and we bring the L over to the other side, so it's an L prime inverse times the B prime. That gives us our U, and it calculates all of the numbers in between where we had these boundary values. Notice the boundary values are there and unchanged. They're exactly what we defined them to be. Laplace's equation did not modify those, but it did fill in everything in between. And so I like to call Laplace's equation the linear number filler inner. And if English is not your native language, calling something a number filler inner is kind of a crazy, silly way to say that. And I, I did that on purpose just to be a little bit silly. Sometimes I like to oversimplify things. So that's Laplace's equation. Enclosed problems. Let's say we have a problem like this. So we have a large 2D array. And somewhere there's this known boundary of numbers. So we know the values here and we don't know the values outside or inside yet. Let's say we really only want to solve Laplace's equation within that boundary, and we don't care about solving it outside the boundary. Now, we probably could formulate this in a way that we do solve it outside the boundary, but if we don't care, it's numerically inefficient to include that in the problem. It's a much smaller problem if we're only including where we care about. So that's what we're talking about here. How do we do this? So the first thing I like to do is create a map function. And this map function will be zeros everywhere, except we place ones where we actually want to solve Laplace's equation. And in this case, the map function includes the boundary. We're going to include those into Laplace's equation. So it'll include all the stuff in the middle where we actually need to get an answer, plus the outside. These are our boundary values along the outside. So that's our map function. It includes the boundary plus all of the stuff where we want to obtain the answer and zeros everywhere else. So we're saying don't solve Laplace's equation here, only here. And so visually, we can see that this is a smaller problem and more efficient. The next thing I'll do is go ahead and build the standard Laplace's equation as we've been discussing for the entire large grid. And so, this is not the grid, this is the grid after we've built Laplace's equation, and this is the matrix L. So it'll be much larger than the grid. Now, we probably could shave a few microseconds off our simulation here if we went ahead and just build Laplace's equation in that region where we're interested in. But if that region has a weird shape or something, that could become a little bit difficult, not impossible. So I like to just build Laplace's equation for the full grid that we were talking about. And we end up with a large matrix equation because it still contains rows and columns corresponding to all the points that we don't care about. So what I'll do then is just literally cross off all the rows and columns that we don't care about. And we end up with a reduced Laplace's equation where the only thing we're talking about here are rows, or sorry, points in our grid that we want to solve Laplace's equation. And this is actually really easy to do in MATLAB. And here's the little code snippet. So we have this array M, which is ones where we want to solve the problem. So I reshape that to a column vector and then find, just when I say find M, it's finding anything that's non-zero. So I get an array of indices where M is non-zero. So anywhere we actually want to solve Laplace's equation, I now have the linear array index inside end. What I'll do then is go into this matrix L, 
and say end in, just L equals L end end. So all the other things that aren't being referenced by end end up getting dropped. And so L is now a much smaller matrix. And I'll do the same thing for B, B equals B end. I'm only retaining where we want to solve Laplace's equation. Everything else gets eliminated. And there's another reason for doing it this way. The alternative will be I could like zero out the rows and columns, but this end will be useful on the next slide as you'll see. So we've reduced L and B with three lines of code given that map function. So step three, we solve this reduced equation. So U equals L back in, or sorry, L backward divide B. We now have the solution to Laplace's equation, but just in that region where we wanted to solve. And that region, us, we had this example where it's square, but it doesn't have to be square. It could be circular or some weird odd shaped thing. And so it's not real clear how you would visualize this. So what I like to do then is build the big full array again, and then insert my solutions where we've found. And that's real easy to do in MATLAB, which is why we calculated in the way we did. So in MATLAB, the first thing I'll do is create the full, full array that we're talking about of all zeros. I'll then say U anywhere in that we're solving Laplace's equation, I'll insert U. And now we have the full array. It is still zeros out here because that's how we initialized it. But then we inserted Laplace's equation where we've solved it. And so by calculating in that way, it not only let me reduce L and B, it let me real easily insert the solution where it was obtained. And so call this solve and expand solution. And so that's how we do enclosed problems. From the bottom of my heart, thank you very much for watching this video. I love hearing your stories about how these videos helped you. I also love answering your questions. So please tell me your stories and ask your questions in the comment section. I promise I will try to answer every single question that's asked. If you like this video, hit the like and subscribe button. I also recommend visiting the official course website that has links to the latest versions of the notes, the latest videos, and there's lots of other resources to help you learn, including implementations in MATLAB. I'll see you in the next video.